exciting is the most important and most fundamental technique in characterization of samples. The first thing you want to know about a material, whether it is amorphous or crystalline. So if you are given powder or you are given a piece of a sample or a drop of a liquid, there is no other way, I mean authentic way, you can see through your eyes that this material appears well organized, its geometry is perfect or things like that. But for example, if you have 100% amorphous glass and it is cut into cubes, for example, or spheres, does that mean that they are crystalline? No. So what you see visibly uh, doesn't tell you whether a material is crystalline or not. You can guess if the material is transmitting light homogeneously, then you can say that there is some random distribution of atoms or ions within the material. And if it transmits, reflects, refracts, diaphracts light in specific directions, there is any specification there, then you can guess that yes, maybe the, the rays are coming across some organized periodic pattern which diaphragms are transmits it in proper specific directions. But that is also not an authentic way. The reliable way which tells you whether a sample is crystalline or amorphous is X-ray diaphragm, right? Materials with no long-range order may be studied by scattering methods. For example, small angle X-ray scattering probe structures in the nanometer to micrometer range by measuring scattering intensity. So the diffraction pattern is produced by bombarding a single crystal with an X-ray beam. Single crystal means that you have a big crystal, right? And you bombard X-ray from different directions upon it or rotate crystals in front of the beam and you get diffraction from different sides of the crystal. But usually, you don't have such large crystals to put it in the sample holder and rotate it in different directions or rotate the X-ray tube around it to get the diffractions from there. So people usually use other methods because there are very few single crystals uh, which can be so big that people can organize it. Uh, some mineralogists happen to recognize crystals from the shapes, but I think they don't have their eyesight to resolve the crystalline planes. But if this is just experience that they go to the uh, related site of the crystalline material and dig it out and they get it and say, oh, this is molite crystal, this is quartz crystal. So people, some people with experience know, but it is from experience. The highest and the most popular authority in molite science was Schneider of Germany. And one day, uh, 
as I told you in the previous lectures, that molite is given to the crystalline form of aluminosilicate because it was discovered in the Isle of Mull. Isle of Mull is the Iceland near Scotland. There are many Iceland, Isle of Man and like that, around the Britain. So when you go to England, uh, uh, Scotland, at the end of that, there is a city called Oban. And you sit in the ship or boat and cross to the Isle of Mull. So we went to Isle of Mull and Professor Schneider was walking around and told me that come here, these are the crystals of molite. And when I dig them out, I took them out, he picked them and told, yes, these are molite crystals. And we took it to the lab and they worked, right? So people recognize, but from the experience, it is, I will not say that it is science, it is skill. That with time, when you work with in the specific field, you start to recognize things. So this is the common sense recognition. But the reliable method is, and the easiest analytical techniques, which is the least time consuming, it is X-ray diffraction. Why X-ray diffraction? Why not other things? Today, I brought this stick, right? Can you measure the thickness of this key with this stick? Why? I'm not hearing you. Because the size of the key is very small and there is no unit on it to tell me that how much is, what is how much, right? But I'm fortunate that the key is some, has some size which is resolvable with naked eye. So if I put a meter rod here, then I will say it is one millimeter or two millimeter, but still it's not very precise. And the reason is that the dimensions of the miring instrument are much, much different than the dimensions of the key. Now, if you want to wear things which are in angstroms, then for that you need some meter rod which can resolve angstroms, whose resolving power is comparable with angstrom. People usually wear length and the units are meter, miles, seconds. Uh, do they? Do they wear distance and seconds and minutes? Why not? What is light here? Light here is the distance traveled by somebody who walks or runs at the speed of light in one year. When you move with the speed of light in one year, this is called one light year. Why light year? Because the dimensions you are interested in are not measurable with meters or miles or inches Right? The dimensions are too huge. For example, they say that the diameter of our galaxy is more than 100,000, several 100,000 light years. So how can you measure that with meter? Because when you start 186,000 miles per second multiplied by 60, tells you 
the distance covered in one minute multiplied by an other 60 tells you about the distance traveled in one hour and take it to the year. So it will become difficult for you to note it. The dimensions are so large. That is why you are intelligently devising parameters comparable with what you are going to measure. The same case is here. We are not using, we can't use meter rod, we can't use screw guide, we can't use vernier caliper because their highest possible resolution will be a few, a few micron, for example. 